Recording? Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to our 16th annual Lenten Lecture Series. 16 years we've been doing our Lenten Lectures here at St. George Greek Orthodox Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. And <clears throat> I know it's a sm relatively small group, but I'm using the microphone mainly so that our video camera can pick up the audio in the back there. Uh, this year's Wednesday evening Lenten lecture topic is modern heresies. And you may have seen the flyer that was distributed in the, uh, the recent newsletter of March and as well as some of the recent Sunday bulletins. And you notice, uh, hopefully notice some of the topics that we'll be covering this year in our uh, let's see, five weeks of lectures every Wednesday night. Uh, under Modern Heresies, we have tonight, we'll be talking about secularism, and I'll start on that topic in just a moment, but the next topics coming after will be humanism, rationalism, pluralism, and philatism. Now, uh, as an introduction, there are some introductory comments. Uh, I always try to do something new and different in Lenten lectures, something that I haven't done before, primarily for the reason of my own interests, uh, trying hopefully to keep my mind fresh. Uh, however, that the downside of that is that I don't get to repeat and improve and perfect these presentations. So uh, hopefully you can join me on this journey and help me convey the message to you and to others as well. Uh, modern heresies is a topic that I've wanted to explore for many years. And in fact, there are a lot of topics waiting in the wings, just not enough lengths to go around. So uh, the introductory paragraph that was in our flyer regarding modern heresies says the following, heresy means false belief or teaching and is very important concern for Christians. The church teaches that incorrect belief leads to inappropriate and sinful behavior. And this is why many church fathers and saints throughout history have fought fiercely to maintain the true faith in Christ, even dying for it. This Lent, we will examine several modern heresies to understand exactly what they are and how they influence us. Then, uh, hopefully, we can discuss some ways to overcome them so that we may be guided on the right path towards salvation in Jesus Christ. So the first thing we probably need to do is talk about heresy in terms of a, a definition. What does heresy mean? Uh, well, heresy is defined in the dictionary as an opinion or a doctrine that is at variance with the orthodox or accepted doctrine, especially of a church or religious system. Um, as you may know, in dictionaries and other texts, when they use the word orthodox, they use it with a small o. Uh, but, of course, we use it for, with the big O, for uh, the capital O for Orthodox. Where does this term come from? Well, in the, they say it comes from uh, Middle Ages English, but actually it really goes back to the French, to the Latin, and, of course, to the Greek. Adesis, which literally means the act of choosing, uh, and it's a derivative uh, a form, a conjugation of caring, which means to choose. So that's interesting, you know, that the root is about choice. Uh, and perhaps I'm trying to, I'm, I'm opining here that I'm actually committing heresy because I'm making an opinion, uh, but, but that's something you choose other than what is kind of normative or received as normative. Uh, looking to the scriptures, the word is used in the scriptures. In the Acts of the Apostles, it denotes a sect. Uh, it could be like the Pharisees or the Sadducees or uh, the Judaizers that Paul wrote, writes against often in his texts, in his letters and epistles. Elsewhere in the New Testament has a different meaning uh, attached to it. And Paul ranks heresies with crimes and seditions in Galatians 5.20. We'll look at some of these passages uh, in just a moment. 
The word also denotes divisions or schisms in the church, as noted in 1 Corinthians 11.19. And in Titus 3.10, it refers to a heretical person, the one who follows their own self-willed questions, who is to be avoided. Heresies thus come to signify self-chosen doctrines not emanating from God. That's where the choice comes in, self-chosen, I choose for myself. And this is a very interesting, uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about epistemology uh, and the why, how we kind of come to know what we know. So the Greek word again is erisis, alpha, iota, rho, epsilon, sigma, iota, sigma. Uh, <clears throat> also defined as the act of taking or capture, as in storming a city, choosing or choice, as we noted before, that which is chosen, a body of men following their own tenets, as we also noted, a sect or a party, and as well referred, uh, used to refer to the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and even to other Christians. Now, Here's, uh, we, we alluded to some of the scriptural passages. <clears throat> Let me read to you Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. St. Paul is writing to uh, the Christians of Galatia, and he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I will tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> The Apostle Peter, in his Catholic epistle, sorry, the second Catholic epistle, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, here's what he says. And context is important in helping us understand these things. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Remember, in, we said in Titus chapter three that uh, it referred to a div device of man, uh, eritikos. So here's that passage, Titus 3, 9 through 11. To, uh, he says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man, that's divisive is the English translation, but it's eritikos, after the first and second admonition knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So you could, you could also translate it as reject a heretical man. Now, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen through 19, we hear St. Paul again writing, For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions, heresies, I'm sorry, schismata in that translation. There are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions. That's where erisis comes in. There must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now, in, in some of these passages, you've heard about false prophets, pseudo prophetes about uh, false teacher, pseudo vidaskalos, a false brother, pseudavelfos, 
about a false apostle, pseudo apostolos, and even false witnesses, pseudo martyrs. So we've heard the dictionary definition, we've heard a few scriptural passages. Uh, so what can we get a little closer to the definition of heresy? Uh, I would say more from an orthodox perspective, although this is a little bit, I think I heard uh, Father Thomas Hopko use this, tr this definition at one time, where uh, heresy is not about a complete falsehood necessarily. Heresy is often, or more often, about taking part of the truth and making it the whole truth, okay? So for example, think about in the Christological controversies of the fourth, fifth, sixth century when the ecumenical councils were being held to confront them, a lot of those heresies had to do with the nature of Christ. Was he human? Was he divine? Was he both? Well, in the Orthodox tradition, what, what ended up, what in a sense won out, was that he is both God and man. He's both divine and human, fully God, fully man. The heresies were when somebody took one or the other and made it the whole truth. So in other words, he's man only, or he's God only, right? So taking part of the truth and making it the whole truth. That's, I think, a good working definition of heresy. Now I want to talk a little bit about some other words that I think are relevant and important to when we talk about heresy. And that one, and it has to do with, you know, kind of with our whole, uh, our whole theme, this Lent. And the first one would be atheism, which of course is the doctrine or belief that there is no God, or the disbelief in the existence of supreme being, of a supreme being or beings. And of course, where does that, where does the word atheism come from? comes from the Greek, Theos, God, Atheos, no God, atheist, or atheism. But there's also uh, other, you know, there's a word directly related to that, of course, which is the shorter form, theism, which is the belief in one God as the creator and ruler of the universe without rejection of revelation. So that, and that distinguishes it from Deism, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Theism also can be defined as the belief in the existence of a god or gods, which of course is opposed to atheism. So deism, so theism, theos, belief in God. Deism, a little it's interesting, related word. Uh, Deism is the belief in the existence of a God on the evidence of reason and nature only, with rejection of supernatural revelation, which of course distinguishes it from theism. So there's deism, there's theism. They both believe in a God, but the evidence of it, uh, or how you arrive at it, is different. And the one deism rejects divine revelation. This will be even more important, I think, when we talk, talk uh, later in the next week or two. Now, where does the term deism, deism come from? Well, it comes from the Latin deus, which means God, uh, which, of course, is pretty close to theos, uh, which is the Greek for God. Deism was actually uh, uh, kind of the approach to God that a lot of the founding fathers of our nation had. For instance, Thomas Jefferson, if I, if I remember correctly, his Bible, he has kind of his own Bible, and he took out all of the miracle, the miracles of Christ uh, from, his, from that Bible, because if you don't believe in supernatural revelation, then, uh, then you, those would not be important. Now, another important scriptural passage for our discussion. Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1 are exactly the same. Does anybody know which, what, uh, what those passages say? 
It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, let's move on to our topic for this evening, secularism. Secularism, which is defined in the dictionary says, of or relating to worldly things or to things that are not regarded as religious, spiritual, or sacred. Uh, might be referring more specifically to things temporal in, in the here and the now. Could also be defined as not pertaining to or connected with religion. And where does this term come from? Well, it's a Latin term, uh, secularis, which means worldly or temporal, as opposed to et eternal. Uh, and it's, it's the opposite of sacred, which is another Latin term. Sacred is devoted or dedicated to a deity or to some religious purpose. Could also mean being consecrated. Uh, sacred can mean entitled to veneration or religious respect by association with divinity or divine thing. Can also mean holy. So what's a, what's a term that, our, that we probably use, even though it's a Latin term, that is very much related to sacred? Anybody? Sacrament. Sacrament. Okay, that's good. What else? Is there one? Sanctify. Sanctify. There's one more where it's the place in the church where we store the vestments. The sacristy. Right? Sanctuary. So, We have secular, we have sacred. That which is not of God, and that which is. Now interestingly, people of faith, in other words, of professed faith in God, can act in a secular manner. And I would say that almost all of us are guilty of doing it at least at some time in our life or at various times in our life especially when we compartmentalize our life into religious things and non-religious things. This is what I do when I go to work. This is what I do when I go to church. And they're not really that connected. So we who claim faith in God may act piously at times but at other times and places, we may act as if we have no faith or belief in God. Now listen to some, uh, some of the some passages here from our worship services and from the scriptures. And just uh, tonight, we said many times in the service, remembering our most holy, pure, blessed, glorious Lady Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. So this is counter to secular, sacred distinctions. Our whole life should be dedicated to God, not parts of our life. If we're approaching life in a secular manner, we, we may compartmentalize certain parts of our life where God does not get to enter into. Or we may act in a way that that does, is not informed by God. Another uh, passage, Matthew chapter 22, when the man asked Jesus, what is the great commandment? And what does Jesus answer? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Uh, you know, implies the whole person is involved in the love of God. Not just part of me, but all of me. Another passage that I think is relevant in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's timeless. He extends across all time. 
even more, I think, even more relevant is the prayer to the Holy Spirit, which we hopefully are using in our daily prayers as the first prayer of the Trisagion prayers. The prayer to the Holy Spirit. O heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fills all things. Treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain of sin and save our souls, O good one. God, the Holy Spirit, is everywhere present and filling all things. You can't compartmentalize him or her. Now, I found a very interesting article. Uh, some of you may know or heard, heard of Father Stephen Freeman, who uh, has, a, has, a, has a, a blog, is a lecturer, is a speaker, on, if you listen to Ancient Faith Radio online or Orthodox Christian Network online, he he's often speaks there. If I remember correctly, I think Father Stephen was at our church maybe 10, 12 years ago or more. He was here for us. Um, I don't know if it, if it was, uh, I know, I think if I remember correctly, he was here for a Sunday liturgy and for our Lenten Vespers. He's got kind of a Southern, if I remember correctly, has a kind of a Southern drawl or accent. And uh, so you may, re may remember him, you may not, but his, his, he has an article uh, about secularism. And how many of you heard the word symphonia, the Greek word symphonia? Okay. Symphonia, symphony, right? Bringing a harmonious uh, sound together, bringing sound together harmoniously. But this term has been applied to the relationship of, of the church and the state in the Byzantine Empire. But it is more, it's kind of more than that in terms of thinking in terms of church as an institution and government as institution. It's really about um, when the church, the inner life of the church finds its way into the greater culture. Okay? So the church, when the church kind of uh, informs the culture, shapes the culture that we live in. But that's an ideal, and that's uh, rarely, been, rarely happened in the history of the world since Christianity began. When we talk about secularism, secular, the, the secular construct of the world, this idea of splitting into secular and sacred, is the hallmark of the modern age. The construct is itself a product of, a, of certain expressions of Christianity and thus has something of an acquired immunity to classical Christianity. In the modern world, Orthodox Christianity encounters the secularized God, the secularized church, the secularized sacraments. And, of course, the tragic result can occasionally be a secularized orthodoxy. So, in other words, we, we identify ourselves as orthodox Christians. We, we basically secularize the church, putting part, parts of it here are, are, are informed by God, other parts over here are not. So, what, is, what does he mean by a secular, secularized orthodoxy? The secular world view... In other words, how we see things uh, is one that does not deny the existence of God, but distances him from the everyday world. Human beings are seen strictly in individualized terms. Communities are seen as only existing through the sharing of ideas and practices. Religious groups can exist in abundance in such a setting, a secularized setting, but largely as expressions of individual choices. The world and the culture are understood to be religiously neutral territory, places in which the presence of religious concerns is inherently unnatural. 
How many of you have heard the, <laughs> the saying, there's two things you don't talk about in conversation? It's politics and religion. That, well, <laughs> that, that too probably. But, but that, that's a perfect expression of a secularized worldview. You, we don't talk about religion. It's just something we don't talk about. So in the secularized worldview, God is a preference. He's a choice. But never is he truly integral to daily life. In other, in other words, he's never integrated into our daily life. In the modern secular world, particularly in its current dominant form, which is consumer secularism, the believer consumes his religious preference. His God, his community, his set of practices are subtly diminished to the set, to a, a set of consumer decisions. It's like having a, a, a buffet, you know? I, I'll pick this, I'll choose that, I'll take this, and that's, I'll put it all together and I've got my own religion, right? The result is often a lifestyle that is largely indistinguishable from that of other consumers. Okay? The pressures of church on, cult on the culture of believers is rebuffed or rebuked. Keep the church out of it. Keep your religion out of it. And often the culture wins. In other words, the secular culture wins. In America, what that often means is an orthodoxy, an orthodox Christianity that is similar to surrounding secularized groups. So specifically, that translates into sporadic attendance at church, uh, attendance that's limited to Sunday mornings, uh, no prayer life or little prayer life at home. Uh, the liturgical rhythm of the year is reduced down to Sundays, Christmas, Lent, maybe, and Easter. I'm sure you've all heard of the term Christers. That's the term that they've, you know, that it's not used much in Orthodoxy, although there are, it could be perhaps, uh, but priesters are those who only come to church for Christmas and Easter. Now, interestingly, if you're looking at the, the, the history in America, what, what is the largest group that successfully resisted secular culture for a time? Think about um, how they perhaps established their religious life and it kind of took on a broad reach throughout the culture and, and was really a big part of their life. Puritans. Uh, those are all uh, good answers. Um, I, I should have qualified that to say the largest non-Protestant group, which is, was basically the immigrant Catholics who came to the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They did face secularism, but it was weak because it was still churchly. However, they resisted the lures of assimilation because they established strong Catholic neighborhoods, Catholic schools, orphanages, hospitals, seminaries, colleges, So they survived by creating something of a, what we might call a parallel culture, you know, parallel to what was going on in normal everyday America. Uh, the Catholics had a lot of stuff going on in their own, in their, of their own identity. But as we know too, but that parallel culture has been greatly impacted or depleted uh, 
they're still Catholic schools, but they're perhaps not quite as strong as they used to be. Um, religious uh, Catholic hospitals now have almost all been sold off to private or private uh, groups or non some nonprofit entities that are not religious in nature. So even even church, uh, universities that identify as Catholic have kind of taken on a secularized identity. Now, with regard, well, the Orthodox that came to America a lot in the late 19th, early 20th century too. Our biggest migrations were in, during those during those times. But the Orthodox never gained the cohesion or the force of numbers as did the Catholics. As we know, there are many, many more Catholic uh, believers than there were Orthodox coming to America. So those meager numbers have declined steeply as a result. And without a large number of converts, orthodoxy in America would be in institutional crisis. However, the conversion of parents, or even the, let's say, the strong faith identity and life of parents does not necessarily guarantee the adherence of their children or their grandchildren. Raising Orthodox families and creating an authentic Orthodox cultural expression have yet to succeed in America with some notable uh, exceptions, but small. So, how, how has secularism kind of affected the Orthodox Church? Uh, much of the Orthodox mission in modern culture follows a pattern similar to Protestant churches, including some of some things that are not necessarily admirable. Our parishes have become commuter communities. Commuter communities. Uh, we have people that drive, you know, from great distances, passing sometimes even other Orthodox churches to come to a particular Orthodox church. Uh, success in the parish is often marked by the ability to pay bills, pay a priest, and eventually construct a building. Success is not marked by the inculturation of faith in the lives of the faithful. But we're not that different than everybody else. Commuting consumers is the default position of religious believers in America. So if you're going to drive to the Mall of America to buy something, you know, that's, in many ways, that's not that much different than driving to a church of your choice, uh, Edicis, to choose, right? Uh, because it meets your individualized needs. Now, you know, this is, I'm talking about the impact of secular culture on the church. Okay, this is in other words, this is not it's not something that that we can necessarily solve in a, a, a day, a two, or a week, or a month, or a year. But the dis, that distinction, this is the important point here. That distinction between secular and sacred, between religious and not religious, is a false distinction. Okay. It's a false distinction. The idea that something is not religious is itself a secular idea. Remember, we're going back to when you, you know, we, we pray that the Holy Spirit is everywhere present and filling all things. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. I mean, this is all, it's basically the implication is, is that God fills everything. There's no place that God is not. We just sometimes think that way or act that way. We begin making mistakes by thinking that the choice is between religious and non-religious things rather than teaching how to be present to God at all times and to learn the presence of God in all things at all times. Let's uh, go to a couple more passages and then also uh, a hymn from the Divine Liturgy. In Jeremiah 23, 24, this is Jeremiah speaking for the Lord, as any prophet would do. 
He says, can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? In Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit, meaning God's spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? This is David speaking, right? David, the king, prophet, who is the author of the Psalms. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. In the hymn from the Divine Liturgy, uh, towards uh, after the consecration, but before Holy Communion, is based on the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. And that hymn goes how? Holy, holy, holy Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to God in the highest. God's glory, in other words, him's God himself, fills the heavens and the earth. There's nowhere that he is not. Think about, uh, think about you know, I know, it makes me think of the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, when they, they basically had, a, because of the influence, the lie of the devil, they created a secular little world where God does not exist or does not have, let's say, uh, presence or authority. And that's when they, they chose, right? They chose to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they, you know, then they hid from God as if they could, <laughs> right? Because they thought there was that we can. There's a little secular place over here where we can hide, and he won't find us. And then you know, God says, "Adam, where are you?" Right? Did he say that because he didn't know where Adam was? No, he said that because he wanted Adam to think about where he was. He was in the wrong place. So secularism, this is where I go back to some of the terms that we used earlier. I think sec, what I would say is secularism is a functional atheism. It's, it's a functional atheism. It's a way of thinking and acting that is practically like an atheist. Uh, propositional atheism is a stated belief. I don't believe in God. Functional atheism is acting like you don't believe in God, even though you say you do. But both approaches have the same result. Now let's close tonight. Uh, this is, I think, it's a little bit different, but I think it's helpful information and shaping our whole discussion this evening and for the rest of the Lenten lectures, at least on Wednesday night. And that was what I talked about earlier, is epistemology. What does the Greek word episteme mean? Episteme. Anybody? Knowledge. knowledge, very good. Episteme is knowledge. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. In other words, how do we know what we know, okay? And there are, this is, this is uh, what I learned. I, I, you know, I, I didn't really know about this until I was taking some of my classes for my doctoral program in the last two or three years, uh, especially pro, uh, classes that have to do what they call psychohistory. And that's basically studying history from a psychological perspective. But there's three main uh, epistemologies, okay? The first one is pre-modernism. Pre-modernism, 
which existed or predominated prior to the 17th century. Okay? And what, so what pre-modernism is, is that you come to know what you know based on a revealed knowledge from authoritative sources. So, um, and pre-modernism believe that ultimate truth could be known. Okay, ultimate truth could be known. And that ultimate truth would be known primarily through direct revelation. And who would that direct revelation come from? God, right? So that was, that was basically how almost all cultures function before the 17th century. Whatever knowledge, whatever important knowledge there is to know out there comes from God, okay? So the sources of that knowledge would be typically the church or religious institutions. Now, what happened in the 17th century that kind of changed things? Basically, the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is, uh, brings about what we call modernism in terms of epistemology. And what, what is modernism characterized by in terms of epistemology? It's characterized by you come to know what you know primarily by empiricism, which means what? Empiricism means that you can see it, you can taste it, you can hear it, you can feel it, you can smell it, you can touch it, whatever. Okay? It's you, you come to know what you know because you experience it directly through the senses. Okay? That's number one. Number two, modern epistemology was characterized by we know what we know by reason or logic, by thinking about it. That's what the Enlightenment was all about. Is what, that's why they call it the Age of Reason. Okay? And what that eventually led to is scientific empiricism or modern science. Okay? So, so what you, 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 you only know what you know if you can prove it scientifically. That's the only truth out there. So the source of authority beginning in the 17th century starts shifting from the church, maybe even politics, governments, kings, uh, and what takes over? What becomes the primary source of knowledge in the modern age of the 17th, after, 17th century on ap afterwards? Well, and where does science really get elevated and explored? It's in the university. The colleges and the universities be now, in the modern age, became the sources of knowledge and authority. Okay? But then, in about the mid-20th century, we have the beginning of the postmodern age. Okay? Postmodern age. And postmodernism is characterized by knowing what you know, you could say through a, a pluralism, if you will, multiple ways of knowing that could be revelational, pre modern, could be through science and reason, reasoning, modern, but also could be through what you might call more individual ways of knowing through intuition, relationships with other people, and spiritual. Maybe it's spiritual in a sense of uh, not, you know, it's perhaps your, your more individualized spirituality, let's say. So the sources of authority now change, uh, change even more Do you, where it uh, it deconstructs previous sources of authority and power because power is to be distrusted or mistrusted. 
so it's a less hierarchical approach where authority sources are more diffuse. And what maybe a simple way of putting it is that the what has become what becomes now the source of authority knowledge in the postmodern age? The individual. So I am the source of knowledge. Right. Now the reason I share that is because uh, it'll it'll inform what we do for the rest of our lectures uh, on Wednesdays, and I think it also helps explain a lot of what we see and encounter in our life in terms of dealing with other people. Uh, in terms of their, let's say, religiosity or their political beliefs. You, if you, when you, so when you think about it, you ask people when you're, in, you're talking about these things with them, say, how do you know what you know? And see what their answer is. So they might say, well, it's because what the church teaches. That's how I know it's what it is. Or they could say, well, it's proven. It's scientifically proven. Or they could say, well, you know, I just know. I know in my heart. Okay? Yeah. Now, uh, so that's the material I want to cover tonight. I hope, and hope it was helpful. It might be a little disjointed, but uh, just trying to get those ideas out there. So is there any questions? Elizabeth? Well, the, I think there's a good argument to be made that uh, intuition is kind of like, uh, you might, some people might call it a gut feeling. Some people might say it's God's voice speaking to us, through us. Uh, but, I, but also I think it implies, you know, in, for that to be true, we have to have a pure heart. Because our passions, you know, those, those desires that have become sinfully incl inclinated, let's say, uh, they, can, they can speak to us strongly in our intuition, but they can also deceive us, right? So we have to be, we have to be um, uh, really seeking to, be, uh, to have a pure mind, a pure heart, a pure soul, so that we can hear truly God's voice within us, and that, yeah, that would be intuitive. So the question or the statement is, is that the Romantic era was a reaction against the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, uh, which was too logical, too intellectual, uh, and started to look at things more um, from uh, aesthetic perspective, perhaps, more of feeling oriented, and that's, you know, that's kind of the pendulum I think swing starts to swing the other way, where you get into more of a sentimentalism. Uh, and it's all, it's, everything's based on feeling. You know, I think our orthodox approach, you know, when we, when we say we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, you're talking about a balance of the, unif you know, the various aspects of our personhood, you know. It's not all about the mind, but it's not all about the heart either, you know. It's, uh, it's about bringing those all together in an integrated manner. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just wondering what you thought sort of was the way forward for the church in this secular culture. Good, good question. Uh, what is the way forward for the church in the secular culture? Well, I think it's, it's important to remember that we don't, I think there's some, some um, let's say, people who in the, in the Orthodox Church think that we have to completely remove ourselves from the culture in order to live our orthodox faith. And I, and I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's what orthodoxy is about. Orthodoxy is more about baptizing the culture, in a sense, by taking what is good and um, sanctifying it, in a sense, and then what is not so good is kind of pushed to the side a little bit. 
but it's not an escape from culture. It's more of a, an, an integration of the culture. So where Orthodox, when Orthodoxy, let's say, or Christian mission was successful, it was where it, it basically baptized the culture. Um, I think probably the best way forward is a, what you might say a martyric witness, you know, a, a, a self-sacrificing witness. If the Christians of the first three centuries could go from a tiny little sect in the Roman Empire to basically becoming, basically Christianizing the Roman Empire, when you think about that transformation, that's amazing. And in, in a three in a matter of three hundred years, which is a relatively small span of time, uh, but how did they do it? They died for their faith, and their their death their, was a witness. People are like, holy cow, they believe so much in their faith, they're willing to die for it. Now, I'm not talking about you know, <laughs> there's people who die for all sorts of things, but it's not it's not a martyric martyr type a witness, if you will, a self-sacrificing for a greater good, perhaps. Uh, so I, I think probably in terms of how we teach and help our own faithful grow, it's, it's about getting people to stop making that secular, sacred distinction in their life, to understand that God is everywhere present and filling all things and you know we um, we just need to we just need to, in a sense to act like that uh, you know that we're everywhere we go god is with us and god is watching us and god's guiding us and if we you know, if we do that we might have a chance you know? Yes, I think we need a we need a uh, how would you call it uh, evan like an evangelistic revival might be a, a one way of putting it you know that where you have very uh, spirit filled people who can lead but that kind of goes back to the witness part too you know I mean uh, you're if you if you're dying for something that you believe in or let's just say even if you're just suffering for something you believe in. That that's a that's a, a apostolic witness in a sense. Other questions? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question is: is uh, we often hear that our church to be uh, to grow must become relevant and I think there are, there probably is some truth to that that uh, we we need to learn uh, to speak the language of the culture in order to uh, help people understand how their faith can be lived out and how God is you know kind of living amongst them in a sense but I think there's a you know the 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 flip side of the coin, the, which is not so good, is that uh, you know relevant in the sense of we, the church, needs to become more like the culture, right? So, and I think that's been tried, and it's failed, and you, especially in you know Protestant churches and the Catholic churches. One of the reasons the Catholic Church has declined is you could argue with the reforms of Vatican II Council that tried to make it more relevant, you know, in a sense of of creating, changing the actual liturgical worship to be less God-centered and more people-centered. Um, and, you know, the guitar masses, I mean, if you read now, even in evangelical publications, they're arguing against guitar masses and modern music in worship because it's too much like the culture. It's too much like the surrounding culture. It's not different enough that it points to something above uh, and so 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 there's a good there's a there's a uh, important part of relevant 
and there's a part that of relevant that is probably to be avoided. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. There. Joel Osteen, right? So, so the question is, how do we explain the the success of the uh, many of the non-denominational evangelical Protestant churches? what you call the mega churches who have thousands of members. Uh, well, I think there's, there's good and, and not so good aspects to that as well. Uh, there's, I think the, the good aspects is that there's probably a genuine seeking that is going on there. You know, people are really looking for something and they're going to where they think they can find it. And probably the, for sure the Protestant churches like these mega churches are better at kind of marketing themselves. They're, they're, they're all about reaching out and finding those people that are seeking something. And, that, and so they, somehow they get their attention and they welcome them, them in, right? Uh, the, 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 the downside of the megachurch movement, and it'll be really interesting to see how long the megachurches last in terms of a movement, but I would say that the downside of the megachurch movement is, is that they if you look closely at them, they have a huge turnover of membership. So the membership is always turning over. There's not a lot, you know, people don't stay as long. You know, we have people in our parish that have been here a whole lifetime. I'm guessing that is not as true in a mega church. Also, mega churches are run on a, typically on a business model. So they have, they have a whole structure of, of managers and executives that are not even ministers. <laughs> they're business people, and they're making a lot of they're making a lot of money in those churches, and uh, so or you know organizationally they're very efficient, and they learn they know how to provide things for what people need. They, many of them are are uh, very good at developing small groups where people you know let's say people, somebody who's divorced there's a group for that, somebody who's a widow there's a group for that. And so they, that's, I mean, that's a good aspect to it. It's a s supportive thing. Uh, so there's also, I think, a little bit of a, you know, that, that relevant kind of approach that some people are looking for. So in other words, I want to go and be entertained. I want to hear some good music. I want to have my cup of coffee when I sit there and... Well, right, exactly. So, so you're so you can see, you, it's almost like why you know going to the movies. You know, you get your maybe I don't know if they, maybe some of them do serve popcorn. I don't know, but but uh, the the whole point is it's an entertainment kind of oriented experience. Elizabeth. Right. That's right. You know, we, uh, if I, I heard a statistic, this is several years ago, that I know one of the large Protestant denominations, I can't remember if it was the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church, their media budget, communications and all that kind of stuff, was like $33 million. This is 10, 15, 20 years ago which back at that time, our whole archdiocese budget for the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese was about 10 to 15 million, okay? So uh, we have a long ways to go to, um, to, to kind of accomplish what we need to help bring people into our church. If we feel that we have the true faith, hopefully we want to share it, but the reality, as we know, is it takes resources to have a church community and to, and to propagate our message. It, it's not for free in, in the culture that we live in. Uh, so, so you're right. 
we have a lot we have a lot a uh, lot of work left to do. Any one last question? Okay, let's uh, have a, a prayer uh, to close. Again, thank you to Lily and for that. Uh, thank you to all your helpers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ our God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in fellowship and learning. Help us to know that you are everywhere present and fill all things, that there is no place that you do not live. Uh, help us to uh, devote our whole life to loving you with our, and to as well to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to give glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, everyone.